event, we were going to do a lock-in, but because of health regulations, uh, we decided it was safer to do a smaller event before the holidays uh, while people are traveling and seeing their families. So a lock-in would usually be like 7 a.m., 7 p.m. to 7 a.m., um, but instead we're doing a winter formal dance, which is like two hours. Um, and I believe we're planning that at Kiwanis, but I'm not 100% sure of that yet. But it's on December 17th. It's going to be fun. Um, and then there was also a financial aid meeting a couple weeks back uh, that was helping the seniors plan for their future. Uh, we had a speaker who walked through the FAST reform, which if you've, if you've seen it, it's definitely a little bit confusing. So it was really nice to have her uh, walk us through it while we were doing it. Um, basically just helping us get set up financially. Along with college too, there's uh, freshmen at our school who are visiting MIAD in December in Milwaukee to explore college options which is basically going to be allowing them to look in to what they might be doing in the future. Uh. <laughs> um, yeah, okay. Then in school, uh, we recently this year introduced interdisciplinary classes. Um, so we have U.S. History and Folk Music, which is uh, social studies and music. And then a small place, which is English and dance, and then cells, which is science and drama, and microplastics, which is science and engineering. Um, these classes definitely encourage more uh, complex projects and offer more collaboration with a very diverse set of peers. There's, I know in some of my classes, there's freshmen mixed with juniors and sophomores and seniors. It's really nice to connect with all those ages. Um, but for example, um, in U.S. History and Folk Music, which is the class I'm in, uh, we're learning about the music behind the colonial times while also learning about the history of Native, <coughs> sorry, Native Americans. Uh, so it's really cool to have that art and academic kind of tied in together. Um, and then other than that, uh, clubs. We have a lot of student-led clubs. Uh, we have Glee Club, GSA, Chess, uh, FTC, which is the robotics club. Um, again, they're mostly student-led, uh, so <coughs> students will take their passions and share them with the peers in like a form of club. So I know my friend Dakota, she is always singing in the hallway, and so being able to see her kind of take her big passion of singing and turn it into a Glee Club was really nice to see. Um, and then spirit days. Uh, we have spirit days at Etude. I make them. Um, <laughs> they're bi-weekly on Thursdays. Um, and it's really fun to dress up in weird, wacky outfits and definitely expresses fun, creative ideas through those outfits. Um, we do have pictures of some of those spirit days on the Etude Think Tank uh, Instagram account, which I also do. Um, <laughs> So definitely go check that out, and we have some other things on that account. It's really fun. But overall, our school is very nice and welcoming, and everyone's so nice and great. Yep, thank you. Excellent. Yeah. Question for you. Um, thank you for your presentation. <laughs> um, so my ad is the Milwaukee um, Institute of Institute Arts and Designs, correct. So how many people are looking to go into that, that college? You don't know? I'm not 100% sure on that, I'm sorry. No, 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 that's fine. So what are your passions? What are, what are you looking for after um, college? Or excuse me, after high school? Yes, I'm in college. Oh, uh, no, I'm in high school. Uh, after high school, I definitely, I want to go to college um, and study English and um, education, try to be a English teacher. Um, yeah, I like, I really like writing, so that, I think that would be my biggest passion. Nice. Yeah. You have the personality, personality and the heart for that, so go after it. Thank you. Other questions for Lily? Thank you. Autumn? Here's 
So my name is Autumn Sears and I'm a junior at Central High School. This is my first year in Sheboygan. I previously went to Sussex Hamilton High School in Waukesha County. So this was a super big change for me and my school is a lot smaller than the one that I was previously going to, which was like, I think upwards of 2,000 kids and I've downsized to 200, 200 yeah. <laughs> um, which was a super big change, but I was already planning on going into an alternative school, which would have been smaller, um, because it, my learning style fits a lot better with that than the strict style of Hamilton. And at this school, I have been able to build a lot more friendships and new relationships and bonds with teachers than I thought I was going to be able to, because I loved most of my previous teachers, and I've been in that district for 15 years as well as my siblings, so I already knew the teachers before I got to the high school. But at Central High, I've been allotted a lot of new opportunities that I wasn't open to or had been, had even seen before. Um, for example, YTY, which is Youth Tutoring Youth, and that program allows students to get real classroom time and experience from the viewpoint of the teacher. I would love to go into education. It's something I've been planning to do for the past two years now. Um, I had an experience um, in a special education classroom in which I was the TA, and I'd never been happier in my entire life, so I decided that that was going to be my career path. And so far, my classroom has definitely helped further that dream, um, and I am very excited for the future. And as well, and in addition to that, I am going to be going to LTC for um, early childhood development. I'm taking a guiding children's behaviors class because I'm already in a classroom with young children. and I would like to have more of a background in what exactly to do or how to handle a situation the best. And as far as Central goes, I am being given a wide variety of electives, such as a yoga course, something that is also a passion of mine that I got to experience at the beginning of this year. And I found that that class helped me to further a habit of mine and starting my day with something that I find relaxing. And it also got me into a more mindful mindset for the rest of this year. And at Central High School, our counselor, Andrea Berlin, is one of the greatest resources that us as students that we have available. She is a fantastic listener and she will do anything in her power to get you somewhere that will be best for your learning um, to help you succeed in school and life. Andrea also gives students the opportunity to be in classes that are beneficial specifically to them and their academic plan. I think that overall Central High School <coughs> staff are very open and they move to make students succeed in school and to make school relevant in their life. Um, and I am looking forward to any new programs and opportunities that I continue to discover at Central. And as I watch my new class of 2023 grow into themselves and see what they end up doing. Right. So why Central? Is the school district has other schools that are smaller in class sizes. Why did you choose Central, if I may ask? Um, Central was the first school I heard about. Mm -hmm. okay. But um, they were very responsive with my previous counselor, like asking them about the school. Okay. And after meeting with um, Andrea and Miss Finney, I I already liked it so far. Okay. And then um, meeting the rest of the staff, it really drew me in and that they were very open in what they can do to help you succeed mm -hmm. um, and still push you to continue learning. So once I got there, you know, my first day, I was like, yeah, you know, this is it. Mm -hmm. And I'm happy that I made that choice. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Appreciate all the insight and um, excited to have you as just recurring representatives. You're welcome to stick around or find some extra reading, either as a <laughs> acceptable option. But 
Uh, we're going to move on to item number seven, which is community input. Uh, is anyone here who can address the board? Okay. So, welcome to this meeting of the Sheboygan Area School District Board of Education. We're pleased that you're interested in educational issues. If you're interested in your comments and concerns about the school district. In order for the meeting to flow smoothly, we would appreciate the following guidelines to be by anyone wishing to address the board this evening. Please limit comments or suggestions to three minutes or less because we do have a full agenda to follow. Comments and suggestions on the school district are welcome. Personal criticism and or derogatory remarks directed at members of the Board of Education or employees of the school district are out of order. If you wish to provide input and would like to be recognized, please raise your hand. After being recognized, please stand and clearly state and spell your name and address for the record. Also, for the record, please sign your name and address on the clipboard after you've spoken. The board normally receives citizen input and does not respond. <coughs> if there's a need for an answer or response to a concern or issue, the superintendent or one of the administrative staff members will get back to you within the next week. Come on up. You certainly can. Okay. Hi, guys. Um, I'm Tracy Alley of 4627 West Renekin Drive in Sheboygan, 53083. Okay. Um, I just have a concern that I want. I wasn't sure if any of you saw the email that I put out last week. Um, actually, I put it out to our principal at Horse Man and queued you guys in on some survey that the DPI puts out. Apparently, it's every two years. I'm new to this, so I'm just finding this stuff out. And I was not happy that I didn't get the opt-out option because our principal forgot to send it out. He apologized. We smoothed it over. It's, it is what it is now. Um, but he did send me a link to a copy of the survey that these kids are taking. And but before he sent that to me, my son took me to his um, Chromebook and pulled it up for me. And we went through the whole thing. And there are some disturbing questions that these 11-year-olds are being asked, um, such as, um, regarding their, like asking these kids, like, what is your sex? Leave blank, if neither. Then when you leave it blank, it goes to, how would you describe your sex? Or asking them if they'd have sexual intercourse. An 11 year old? Are you kidding me? This is like, my blood boiled. I'm not happy. And I want to know this, from my research on the DPI website, it says high schools are supposed to get these. I want to know when middle school got brought into it. I want to know if there's funding involved. Do we have to have our district do these? Is it like a mandatory thing? Who's in charge of that? Because I don't want to see this given to these kids, especially 11 year olds. Like my son, they talked about it amongst themselves after they were done. Nobody even knew what half of this stuff was. So I want to know what the purpose is. What is the purpose of this test, or te survey? With all the other hundreds of surveys, I think we can find better use of time digging more into reading, writing, and math. Instead of, I wanna know how much time is spent on all these surveys from all these places that these kids have to do. It's just filling their head full of <clears throat> nonsense, garbage, that shouldn't be filtered into their minds. They're innocent children. Why are they being asked at 11 years old if they're having inter sexual intercourse, which those kids don't even know what those words mean. So that's what I would like to know, is who, who's in charge of setting these tests up? Who signs up the district for it? Do we have to do it? I know the parents are supposed to get an opt-out option, but what if you missed that, like I did? And now here my 11 year old took this stupid survey, tainting his mind with all this garbage. Sorry. So that's what I leave you with. Thank you. Praise. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else here tonight who cares to address the board? Anyone else who cares to address the board? Is there anybody online? 
on to item number eight, which is the superintendent's report. Step up. Yeah. Good evening again, everyone. Uh, thanks for being here. Uh, first of all, uh, just to share some things going around our district. First of all, I want to give a congratulations shout out to David on his award of the Athena Leadership um, Award. <laughs> Uh, very important award. It recognizes individuals that uh, uh, em exemplify strong leadership qualities and forge paths for women within our community. So, congratulations, David, on that. <laughs> on November 11th, for Veterans Day, we were uh, able to host our uh, annual Veterans Day celebration at North High this year. Had a great turnout of, of community members. Uh, veterans. Um, it's always a, a great uh, event between the speakers um, and the the band, uh, orchestra, and choir. Uh, it uh, the kids did an amazing job. Um, so many of the veterans were just in awe of the of the response from students, uh, both during the ceremony but then after about thanking our vets for their service and and through the understanding. So again. Uh, took place on November 11th on Veterans Day, so that was a, a, a great event. Uh, Lieutenant, Lieutenant Governor Mandela Barnes uh, visited a, uh, at South High School on November 9th, met with representatives from both North and South, uh, representatives from the We Rise at South and the North Start groups, um, really looking at students that had opportunities to engage uh, with him and be able to address questions um, around a variety of topics, uh, both locally and at the statewide level. So again, it's always great when we can have the governor or lieutenant governor uh, be within our school system and interacting with students. Uh, December 9th, the uh, upcoming event will be the Hour of Code. Um, it's a wonderful opportunity. It's open to all students, parents, and the community members, ages four to 104 and everything in between. It's really a global movement to reach millions of students across the, the world uh, to participate in a variety of hands-on tech-based activities to really talk about getting passionate for computer-based coding. Um, Acuity has been a, a wonderful sponsor for many years and they actually will be sponsoring raffle prizes uh, for those in attendance. So looking forward to that event on December the 9th. Um, in terms of just keeping you up to date uh, in terms of effective communication, you should have uh, seen the um, email that I sent out and really want to thank Mark for his work on getting the request for proposal for the purchase and or development of the district owned property on Taylor Drive. Uh, that was posted last week on uh, both the, our website and also in the Sheboygan Press. Um, proposals will be uh, received um, through January 14th at 3 p.m. And then uh, we'll be bringing back uh, those proposals and talking about next steps with the board. Um, so that information is out there. And then Mark spent time working with Chad Pelichek at the, at the city as well, since many of the zoning and indoor uh, needs of the community go through the city planning. Um, so that information is out on our website. Um, and then uh, finally, I know we, uh, we gave a shout out to, to Mark last time, but uh, again, appreciate all of the support of the Sheboygan Public Education uh, Foundation and their um, All In for Education. And Mark again was our winner of that event this year. So congratulations, Mark, for, for your uh, work on winning Texas Hold'em. And uh, uh, Spef, uh, I haven't seen the results yet. They unfortunately, they had to cancel their November meeting. And so I haven't heard their final results of what the what their um, fundraising uh, amount was this year, but uh, they filled every seat um, and at, the, at every table this year, so it was a great turnout with a lot of good competition. So that concludes my report. Um, yeah, thank you, thank you, Kyle. Uh, Seth, um, we've been at least I've noticed on uh, various uh, Facebook feeds uh, from from the school saying that. Um, that the Sheboygan Shoreline um, bus is, uh, is your, your cha the contract is being changed to where um, the students will no longer be able to have um, to use their ID to travel the bus um, whenever, where, wherever. Now it's now it appears to be only during school hours. Um, just wondering a, a couple of questions like what what drove that um, that decision. Also, too, would that have an impact on the budget? Because if I remember right, I could be wrong on this, 
Um, we had also helped subsidize some of the, some of the some of those bus passes. Um, will that have a positive impact on our budget because we're not paying, you know, for the hours that the kids are in, that the kids are not in school? Yeah, so good question, Ryan. You know, a few in there. So first of all, we do we do pay for the service to have our kids uh, ride the bus. One of the challenges the bus uh, Shoreline Metro and we were facing was because it was left open, meaning the not just the routes before school and after school, but it was left open for all nights and weekends. Uh, they were having some concerns with Shoreline Metro, uh, with kids uh, just riding the bus around the city and then causing some, uh, some issues. So we met uh, representatives from the school system um, and uh, uh, the mayor's office and the Shoreline Metro and the city administrator met to try to problem solve how can we address that. We had some non-negotiables and I walked in uh, to that meeting and, and with Mark and our principals on non-negotiables which was we don't want to per, uh, limit those students who need transportation to and from work, school events, uh, the library, for purposeful needs after hours. But the after hours piece was the concern. And so we were able to come up with a, uh, with a um, voucher system uh, that if a student has a need, a job, if they're on a sports team, they're in a co-curricular activity where they need to take a bus later than 4.45, to get home, uh, that they are able to uh, get a voucher from the school. So if I'm playing basketball now, I can go from the school if I need the bus transportation, and the school will complete that voucher, and then they are allowed to ride free of charge for those events. So really was able to look at a, at a potential solution. We're gonna try this out to see how it works, but that was really to eliminate uh, kids that were just unfortunately causing some issues while riding the city bus, just to ride the bus and ride the bus and ride the bus. Did anything have to do with um, you know what happened at the transport the trans, at transfer point with the with the murder of that of of that uh, the, of that student? Would that was that part of this, or is that just kind of a global? In, there there are there are multiple incidents, and we need to you know, we need to address it. That was unrelated, to that. and that actually we were working through this this process well before that okay. unfortunate incident occurred. But again, if you have a need, if students have a need to get to, um, it's really, it's just the night time. So if they have a need on the night time to get past 445, they are able to get that voucher. Um, it's an easy process um, so that they can continue to ride the bus and then they're there for, for a reason. Thank you. Any other questions for Seth? Thank you, Seth. Item number nine, this is eight. Charter school grant authorization. We'll have Jake and Eric and Jason. We'll be putting up on a screen behind you. Well, if you want to focus there or on your um, computers. We'll turn over the, the ricker. Should be ready. Okay. Go ahead. All right. Thanks for having us tonight. So we are seeking. Uh, Approval for reauthorization for the 22-23 uh, school year, um, similar to past charter contracts. And we try to do that in advance so both our schools and our families can plan accordingly. Uh, so we're looking for Warner High School tonight. Um, we've enjoyed an almost two decade uh, partnership here with Warner Schools. Uh, last year uh, was Warner Middle School, so I think kind of that transition to Warner High School is a big part of, of that uh, continuation of services. Um, I, I think from, from a district level, I feel like um, we've had a, a very good working relationship. We continue to have a good working relationship with both Jason and their board. I think Jason's transition into the role has really brought uh, an increased focus on, on the college career readiness piece that um, he's got a strong background in and has provided a nice, uh, I would say, boost for, for Warner Schools. Um, I think I had some things that I was going through in my head of, of things to highlight and I think when I listened to Jason talk at the beginning of our meeting tonight, he summarized things much better than I ever could in terms of um, the importance of, of having options within our district and in a school where, where kids feel at home. And I think in the last year and a half, um, the importance of having an option like Warner has become uh, even more important for our district and, and the students that, that choose that option. Um, lastly, Jason highlighted a couple things. I think we're in a very good spot financially with Warner and they're excited to move into a 
the place we're in, sitting right now, uh, <laughs> next year. And, and then lastly, but maybe the most important, uh, they continue to do well uh, academically, and Jason will show, share uh, how some of their goals for the past five years, uh, where they're at and where we're headed going forward. Thanks, Jake. Thanks, Eric. Go ahead and get started here um, with the slideshow that was prepared and uh, sent to you prior to this meeting. So we'll, we'll just kind of open up with, I think, some of the trademarks of Warner High School over the years. Um, these were listed in the contract uh, five years ago and still hold true to this day. Uh, number one, project-based learning. So how we incorporate project-based learning at our high school would be seen in our Tuesday-Thursday schedule. So many of our students on Tuesdays and Thursdays uh, take advantage of the, the very popular option of having experiential, immersive learning at Baywood Environmental Park. Um, you know, I think if, you know, when I'm talking to people about our school, it's certainly one of the first things that, that I think stands out about our school, what makes us different, and also what um, is really enjoyed by our teachers and our students that are in that program. Um, and then those students that are not in the Maywood program, they stay back at our river, riverfront site and part of their Tuesday, Thursday schedule is project-based learning coursework where they get to drive that project um, through their own interest and skills um, and get to exhibit their learning um, in, I'd say, more traditional relative to the experiential learning at Maywood. Technology-infused courses, um, so that's taken on, you know, I think a different meaning over the years, um, but I think where you would see technology-infused courses at Warner High School today is through our math curriculum, um, where other schools use Alex Math as an intervention. Um, it has become the backbone of our uh, math curriculum, and the things that we enjoy about it are that it is personalized, which is true to our core. Um, and that students, they can accelerate or they can pull back as needed um, on their pacing throughout their math curriculum. Um, and then every other course in our uh, catalog essentially is housed on a web-based platform that allows students, whether they're in person or learning online, to have easy access to their coursework from any location. Number three up there is the personalized learning plans. So the way that we uh, carry that out at Warner High School is through our bi-weekly or every other week one-on-one -on -one advisory meetings. So all of our teachers are also advisors and they meet with their students one-on-one -on -one. Um, and during that time they go through the student's academic and career plan. They update that. Uh, usually the, the, the more consistent updates are with their academic progress and their courses and then there's other times when they're we're updating things that they the students have experienced through Zello um, or other aspects of their academic and career planning process. Number four is the flexible scheduling. And, and really, I think this is one of the most important aspects of Warner High School that appeals to the modern educational consumer. Um, that students and families have the choice to attend in person five days a week. Um, they could choose online five days a week, or they could build a schedule that is a mix of those two things three-day or two-day in-person or online schedules. You know, we have some students that are on our campus just one day a week and four days a week they're on a college campus taking college courses. So it really allows for that customization uh, that we can tailor courses to each student's needs. If we go to the next slide then is the overview of the charter goals that were laid out some five years ago. Um, these are as they were written in the previous charter contract. So number one, 80% of Warner High School seniors will be on track with ACP, which equals employability skills, college acceptance, or military. Now I, I wrote this as it was in the charter contract, however, since that time, the district, of course, we've adopted the college and career readiness report card that we use, and so we've been able to really, I think, better define what is college and career readiness since uh, five years ago. Um, so I'd encourage you to pay less attention to if it says goal partially met or met. Um, I'll go through that uh, very shortly. Number two, community connections. 80% of Warner High School seniors will connect with the community through college and career readiness and or project-based learning. Number three, ACT Aspire. Warner High School students will meet or exceed the SD average 
on the ACT Aspire, which is the uh, state test that we uh, administer to ninth and 10th grade students. And then the ACT, um, the big CODA, that's the one for our juniors. So our goal is to meet or exceed the SAST average for our juniors on that test. So now take a little deeper look at each one of those goals over the last five years. So I've broken down on uh, these next two slides that you have really both go with goal number one, separated out the career readiness from the college readiness. So you can see there that over the last five years, we have, um, we have met or exceeded at the 80% benchmark for career readiness. Um, now note 2018, there isn't district data. That was the year prior to the building of the district college and career readiness report card. So we didn't have that district data. However, we, we were able to go through student by student. Fortunately, we only had about 30 students in that class as we normally do. Um, and we're able to, to find that data. Um, and then the next slide. I also jumped in there. I just want to also point out the fact that so 2022 is our current year and that's obviously a work in progress. It's not necessarily a decline. We've got kids uh, still finishing up community service hours, credits and uh, yep. dual credit courses, et cetera. Yeah, thanks Eric for stopping me on that. That's a really good point. I would say that 2022, both on this year and you'll see in the next year, I project that we will hit that 80% benchmark. Um, but like Eric said, we have when this was prepared, we only had a quarter of this year under our belt, um, and a lot of that stuff happens over the totality of the full year or four year experience. The next one is the college readiness data. And again, 2018 didn't have the district data, but um, we did for the following years. And you can see there, although we did not hit the 80% benchmark, I think it's important to note that that trend from 2019 and going forward. and what I see is a, a very realistic scenario that in 2022, this current senior class, that we will hit that 80% benchmark for our college uh, bound seniors. Um, so trending in the right direction and um, out of the last, this year and then the previous two years exceeding the district uh, numbers on college readiness. So we can go to the next one. So then this one aligns with goal two for the community connections. Now what we had to do on this one really was to uh, look at the college, or excuse me, the career readiness data in our college and career readiness report card. So we define that based on work-based learning, 25 hours of community service, or a college credit course. So each of those years, and then again, like Eric noted earlier, 2022, um, I fully anticipate that we'll reach that 80% mark for community connections as it, as it is defined there. The next slide is the ACT Aspire numbers. So um, you can see on that chart, uh, the ACT Aspire tests students in the areas of English, English language arts, uh, math, reading, science, and writing. However, there, there were uh, no writing tests included in those tests during the years uh, that we're looking at. Um, so we exceeded the district average in 14 out of 14 uh, opportunities there um, in all of those curricular areas for ninth grade. If we go to 10th grade, um, we hit that 12 out of 14 times, 86% of the time, we exceeded the district average for our 10th grade state assessment. Uh, the only two occasions where we did not was in 2018 on the English test and in 2021 with the reading test. So that would be 10th graders. If we go to the 11th grade, this we, we noted as uh, partially met, and I think the reason why we, we said partially met is because even though we hit it 21 out of 24 times, 88% of the time, we thought seeing a, a cluster of not exceeding the district average in math, thought that was worth noting, and also a point where, you know, to your question, Mark, an area that we're trying to improve is in the area of math. So that's where I think you can see that. Um, also of note is um, after the 2019 class is when we uh, started using Alex Math as our primary piece of curriculum. So we'll go on to the next thing. So now that leads us to uh, going forward. Uh, so our five-year goals starting next year and then the, the next four after that. Um, I took from our previous goals, 80% uh, of our seniors will be college and career ready 
as measured by the SASD College and Career Readiness Indicators. So I just kind of updated the language from five years ago, made sure that it aligns with our district language, and then I kind of coupled that with the community connections goal, which really is just, it's really another career readiness indicator. Um, and then the second and third goal is the ACT Aspire. And then of note, um, it's my understanding that it's possible that the state could be moving away from that. So in these next five years, if it's not called the ACT Aspire, we would take that to mean the state standardized test for ninth and 10th grade students. And then the third is the ACT benchmark that will meet or exceed the SASD average. Finally, uh, yep. question mark. I mean, I know that this reflects the previous contract, but the 80% uh, mark is a little bit concerning. Maybe Jake can speak to that on the part of the district, but I mean, we're kind of saying it's okay that 20% of our seniors are graduating and they're not ready to go on to college or to go into the career path. And that's kind of concerning. I mean, that's, that's a lot of kids, you know, or 20 out of 100 kids yeah. that aren't ready. And I mean, and that's what our whole purpose is here is to have them reach that as a senior. Point well I, taken. I, mean, I, I guess I'm... Yeah, why 80%? Why, why not 100%, right? Well, and I know, you know, and I know it, it's going it, to, you know, I, I know it might not be able to achieve 100%, but yeah. I mean, it's kind of like we're expecting to get a, a low B here to be cool. <laughs> right. Yeah, so I guess one aspect of it, I mean, these seem like um, pretty clear cut, you know, numbers, right, with the mark. Um, one thing that does complicate it is that it is driven by student choice, right? So if I, as a student, uh, go through high school and I say, I, I intend to go to college, well, then that's going to factor into that college readiness mark, even though that student's day to day actions probably. You know, may not speak to that college path. So they, they take the survey one time a year, um, and that becomes like what bucket they go into, right? So, I mean, all of our students are in the, co the career readiness bucket, but only those that say, I intend to go to college. So a kid marks yes in that moment, now they're factoring into that number. Um, so it, it, can, it can slip on you a little bit when you're, if you're not careful, because you go through, each student you say well you know every day they've said you know I plan to go uh, to it on a different path right but in that survey they said I'm going so to I guess are we saying that we're trying to achieve 80 percent of the dual goal of college and career readiness or the combined goal of I, ha I haven't had it separated in there um, I have it as 80 percent but um, I would fully expect that the career readiness to well exceed 80% as we have over the last five years. We've, so this is the dual that. achievement of career and college. Right, okay. yeah. Yes, so if a student marks a survey on one of their college and then they decide they want to enter the military instead, yep. are they marked as unsuccessful on the college end of it? Or does the military take its place? It's when they take the survey. So they take the survey in their senior year, they mark what their intentions are, and then after that we don't go back in and change it based upon what they do, because we don't know what they do. Uh, so what they say is what they like. We don't know if they go to the military. Measuring whether or not they're prepared for God. Right. For God. So are we talking different things here? Yeah, I think you're talking, I mean. I'm I, just confused a little yeah, bit by so what you're saying. Jake, just sort of restate that again. And yeah, so what's happening is in our senior year, our kids are are taking a survey. They're saying whether they're going into the, a career, whether they're going to college two year, four year, whether they're going into the military. That information we then upload into Skyward, and that's how we can desegregate this data based upon what their choice is. So if a senior in their senior year tells us they're going to college, we're going to run this data and we're going to expect them to hit the college benchmarks. If they don't, it gets marked as a kid that we didn't, we didn't get um, where we wanted to get them in order to be ready for college. If they decide sometime over the summer, I'm not going to college, I'm going to go into the military, we don't know that they do that, so they just stay in that college cohort, and that's how we look at that data. 
can you can you give me an example of uh, under that academic and career planning? I understand what you know, college acceptance that's very clear, entering the military very clear. What what specific kind of employability skills are you looking at, and how do you measure that? So what we've done is we've adopted the district career readiness benchmarks. So um, eighty percent, or excuse me, ninety percent attendance. Ninety percent attendance, um, a work-based learning experience. It, it's actually uh, two of these, right? So there's there's two different uh, benchmarks they have to hit out of the list of four or five that are out there. That's ninety percent attendance, twenty-four hour, twenty-five hours of community service, workplace learning experience, industry credential, dual credit, career pathway course, or two or more organized uh, co-curriculars. And if they hit two of those. Um, the research firm Redefining Ready says that they're career ready. And I, how did how did those expectations get conveyed to the kids, and how often are they reminded of that or encouraged in areas that they may not be there right now? That they yeah, need, that, that, that they is need a, to up their game. Right. <laughs> yeah, and, that, and that's one of the great benefits of having this. We can clearly articulate that. So when students are meeting with their advisors, which we're doing every other week we're able to, to see where are they on track to meet those college or career readiness indicators and how does that align to their intentions after high school. So I, I mean, it's, it's front and center as far as our communication goes, yeah. And are we doing that at the larger high schools too? Yes. But they don't, don't meet with an advisor every other week? No. No, they can look at it in homeroom. It's on their Skyward. There's a student report that uh, the counselors run and discuss with them, um, probably not as frequently as what Jason's doing at So that's one really good positive about your school. That you're, yeah, I mean, that you're of a size that you can manage that right. and you have a plan in place to frequently check in with what they're doing. Right. That's good. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, with those individuals that are not college ready, are there being are they being followed up with by counselor? to figure out what their path in life will be to hopefully help assist, navigate them through, like vocational school or some other type of training because someone might stick in a family business. Uh, there's a lot of other things that's happening. But are we following up with them to ensure that they're not, as he's saying, being lost in the data? Yeah, I mean, the the bulk of that work is, is being done intensively with those students in that, those biweekly meetings and then <coughs> As they become seniors at our school, uh, all of our seniors take a course called College of Career Readiness. And that is taught by our school counselor. So they have that a couple of times a week. So, I mean, they're going through that in depth and getting that personal uh, advising uh, through our school counselor. But the bulk of that work happens up <coughs> till graduation. And then, um, you know, we even, you know, this, and this is not just a Warner program, this is a district program, but. We have a, um, a summer texting program that we've implemented over the last uh, two years where we um, provide supports for students making that transition from high school to college to kind of alleviate that, that summer melt. And then we've taken it a step further for students that are pursuing uh, careers um, or the military, whatever their post-secondary path is, um, they're getting targeted text messages to support them in that path so that they can get to that next step. Because we, what the research shows is that you know you, you lose a lot of kids, whether it be in college or maybe they intend to go into the military, but something happens, right? And they don't reach that destination. So I think that that's that little added step that we as a district have implemented for our graduating seniors. Last page sure. and then we'll come back to questions. Yeah. Um, so then the last page, and I apologize, it's uh, really condensed uh, the numbers there. But if I could just draw your attention, I think the most um, kind of interesting uh, row would be the carryover row uh, toward the bottom of the page. And you can see um, that uh, dark, <coughs> bolded vertical line that's like. Uh, present or I guess that would be at the conclusion of our current contract and then going forward from right to left which I've realized now is backwards to how we read everything in life so I apologize um, 
So, but the carryover row is toward the bottom. Uh, and if you look where we are right now, our carryover stands at $566,271 combined between our middle school and our high school. And I understand that we're just looking at the high school today, but the high school itself um, stands at $354,313 per carryover. Um, so, uh, you know, our, our school leadership, even well predating me, um, has been very fiscally responsible with our dollars, um, almost to a fault, but with the intention of trying to save that money with the intention of being able to maybe purchase a building, which um, we'll now be able to use those funds on renovation, not in this room, this room's great, uh, but with <laughs> other rooms on the second and third floor, which we're really excited about uh, starting in the next couple of months. So um, with that, I'll stop and open it up for questions. Um, let's just hang on to that um, carryover money. I know you have a line in here with rent. Yeah. And I'm assuming when you're in this building, you won't be paying rent. Correct. So that, that'll just fall to that carryover or like you said, use, okay. Uh, the other thing was the um, number of pupils mm -hmm. or students that you were going to have. I really didn't see an increase, but now I have to go back and look at it and see if I was reading it backwards. I, I'm used to going from left to right. Um, and um, so you're looking at 130, 125. So there is a, never mind. I was reading it the opposite way. I was going from left to right. So. Yeah, which is logical. Yeah. Um. Um, so I, I was just wondering why it was decreasing and not increasing. Yeah. But I, I would say um, just incremental increases. I, mm -hmm. you know, I, I think we've, we've highlighted tonight you saw uh, earlier with our student representative uh, one of the great strengths of our school is its size that we're not trying to be bigger than who we are um, and so we don't want to grow just to grow um, so we need to make sure that that is uh, sustainable with our staffing model that we currently have in place okay. thank you you're welcome So as we, we got them out, it's always a um, kind of a shot in the dark when DPI is going to release these and they give us a date and then that changes and we're never quite sure. So um, they did release them and Kelly got the exact summary out to you. Um, she'll talk through kind of her analysis as she uh, speaks with people from DPI, people from CISA, um, et cetera. She's going to steal her thunder because she's going to say, caution you on these because test participation that's the um, thing that we hear about 10 times a day from anyone that we talk with but um, there are some things that we can take from these scores especially at the elementary and middle school at the high school level we're um, typically much more focused on college and career readiness we'll talk through that a little bit um, and answer any questions you may have okay Good evening, everybody. We are going to start off just talking about what's new with this year's report card. The last time we were issued a report card was back in 2018, 2019. So there are some new features to our report card. We'll take a look at our district report card, then move on to our individual school report cards, just looking at um, where they fall um, in the categories. Um, then we're going to talk a little bit about um, new to our report card, the course and program data, and that ties really nicely, dovetails into our college and career readiness report card that our district um, has been using for some time and I would dare say um, was ahead of the game um, looking at 
um, the benchmarks that would meet um, criteria for our students to be considered college and career ready. So uh, to start with what's new, um, first of all, as Jake said, right there, the first bullet talks a little bit about the caution we should use. Recall that the Sheboygan Area School District um, just on average for all of our testable grade levels was at about 20% of our students not testing, um, likely for a variety of reasons, many of them uh, COVID related uh, as far as choosing not to come in for assessments and things like that. So just caution when looking at that, that we had um, about 80% of our students participate, unlike usual years where we're at 95 to 98% of our students participating. Yeah. Yes. Can I just ask a quick question? Can you just set the stage for us now? This is COVID related. Yes. Our students are learning from home, a hybrid. Yeah, so I mean, last year you might remember we did hybrid at our secondary levels and at the elementary level, we were um, in person five days a week, just an hour um, short each day. Um, and so we had quite a bit, we had a a third of our elementary population opt to do 100% um, virtual last school year. Um, so that that um, also is playing into who our students are that took this assessment. Now we did offer for all of our virtual students to come in and take these assessments, but again, it was a parent choice if they chose to participate in that way. Um, so you said 25% did not? So we had about 20% between grades three through 12 that participate that did not participate. That did not. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Uh, um, quick question. Yep. Go ahead. Yeah. So for those, you know, about 80%, so about a 15% drop. Do we have a uh, feeling or any data points to if these are going to be more um, about a higher level group or is the low level depending on the parents opted out? Because that can weight the data one way or another. Correct. Correct. We haven't had really a good opportunity to look at who opted in, who opted out, to see if that would influence our results. But I have had an opportunity to just look at ourselves um, real quickly. I mean, last Tuesday is when this data was released to the public, so it's the first opportunity I've had to look at um, other districts as well. But what we do see in general is the smaller that population uh, size is of participating, the more there was an impact in, in outcome that was not similar to what had happened in previous years. Um, that's not across the board, that's not every district, but what we are seeing is, um, you know, we, we were at 80% participation. If you look at districts that fall below that, we, we saw um, not comparable outcomes um, to 2018, 2019 when we last received report cards, so. You're gonna, uh, you'll see a couple of things here, and I think you'll start to maybe to see it in the media too as they try and weigh the effects of, of COVID on education. Um, one you're going to see, and, and we've spot checked, we, it's not a, anything you can do perfect in-house because kids came and went from virtual learning so frequently, but our kids that chose to go virtually uh, did not do as well as our students who were in hybrid or face-to-face, -face, right? So that's going to be one, that's going to be a third of our students. And it's not every single student. I hesitate when I say that because, uh, you know, faces come to mind, right? Like, like the girl that would pre present from North last year and talked about how good it was for her. N nothing against her. She probably did really well. But as a group, uh, that group, that group struggled, right? Um, the other thing you're going to see in this, and, and we've had a little time now to look at other districts, is it hasn't mattered if the district was open or closed, per se, face-to-face. -face. According to report card scores, it has correlated directly with the number of students in poverty. Um, so the higher the level of poverty in the district, the bigger the hit on the report card. Um, so you can take a look at, at schools, at districts that were closed considerably more than us. Um, their score might have gone up, right? And you can look at score the schools with high levels of poverty that were open, hybrid, whatever, and, and they got hammered. So it's really been interesting to look at it through that lens. It's, um, really, it's, a, it's, it's poverty that has kind of been a uh, common denominator here. Um, just, um, okay, just one second. No, so no, it's okay. Um, so a couple other features that when we look at this, you're going to see more graphic representation and less tables, less text. Um, hoping that the interpretation of the scores is more clear to the user. Um, 
Also, there's a new feature that's called closing gaps. Uh, previously, or sorry, the, the closing gaps was removed. Now um, it's called target group outcomes. Um, in there, again, if you look, it's really looking to identify first based on performance on these assessments, the bottom quartile of students, and then it takes other um, factors into consideration, <coughs> achievement, growth, absenteeism, and attendance or um, graduation rates. So those are new to us, and we'll kind of we'll, uh, talk about that just a little bit. Um, next one. So with the target group outcomes um, being a new feature, what they did get rid of was a deduction system from the dropout or absenteeism. So there's no longer um, a point deduction if you didn't meet a certain percentage of students attending because it's incorporated into that target group outcomes. And finally, new um, to us based on a state statute, we are um, required to report out on our um, post-secondary preparation and arts course participation at the high school level. So we will uh, touch base on how that went um, this year. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I don't mean to laugh. You'll, you'll get the joke in a minute. Um, so again, as a district, we were identified as meeting expectations. There are four areas that go into this overall score. The first being achievement, followed by growth then those target group outcomes, and finally that on track to graduation piece. Um, the nice thing about that new target group feature is it is very specific of who those students are. It, like I said, first identifies them based on their assessment scores for the current assessment year, and then it works backwards three years and then looks at their growth from that three year period um, to help us in schools target who those students are specifically so that we can work to close those gaps. What I do notice is um, our growth scores in particular have a significant weight. I haven't figured out all the math on how that final score is calculated. Um, and if you figure that out sooner than me, let me know. But um, it, is, it is very meticulous uh, calculations, but the growth score for our district and uh, the other district seems to have a significant weight. So regardless of how our students come to us, our responsibility is to grow their learning. Yeah, go ahead, Ryan. Is that um, target group, is that, is that individualized per district? You know, um, or you know, is it kind of every student that fits within certain criteria, no matter if it's Sheboygan, Sheboygan Falls, Milwaukee, or Abbotsford, um, do they all, does it all have the same criteria? Good question, yes, yeah, so the criteria is the same. What that means is our district has a, a uh, subgroup in that category. Um, similarly, schools would have a ident identified group so long as they meet a certain number of test takers. So every school potentially could have actionable uh, subgroup. Now this last year created some unique um, situations there for our schools. In fact, um, I'm trying to think where I have it here. Um, this year, based on how just the amount of test taking and whatnot played out, we had 15 schools identified with target groups. No rhyme or reason, so don't go to think that it's the big schools versus the little schools. Again, has to do with some of the calculations of achievement compared to growth compared to absenteeism. Um, so 15 schools that currently have target groups to focus on and nine that don't have that data available this time around, but very likely will next next time. Is there a way that we can get those, <laughs> what those criteria are? Yeah. <laughs> no. Oh. Oh, another last Like, I think we're, I, I don't know. I feel bad. I'm just going to say it straight. This is This report card is a mess, right? So we come here and we try to make sense of it to you. The target groups, we don't know what they are. We don't know who's in them. It changes. Really? Um, it used to be very like straightforward as far as you had ethnic target groups, you had special ed, you had EL, right? Now it looks like they're putting them together uh, if you don't have enough. So you'd, you'd have to have like 20 in a, in a grade level, right? So now it looks like they're going to combine special ed with EL. But when they say it in their literature, they're really careful about how they phrase that. Um, so we're not, you know, Kelly emails and tries to get answers from DPI, but it's not perfectly clear. The growth stuff we've been working on, Seth 
when did we hear from value added? That was probably 2011, 2012. Yeah, 10 years ago that we went and listened to VARC talk and, and that's the group that does it out of Madison. And value added is great, but they can't explain their formula to you. Um, so it's like art, you know, when we, when we see it. Yeah, but what's really scary about that is you start having conversations with them about, okay, you can't explain your formula to us, but tell us what it means and how we get growth. Mm -hmm. And you can't, you can't get a good answer. Um, and I think you see a school like North High this year drop, and they drop because of growth. And I look at John, and I don't, we don't know what to tell him. I don't know what to tell him to improve on. I don't know what to tell him to work on. Um, and, and they can't figure it out either. Uh, and the other thing that they just flat out admitted to us when we started questioning them is like, so there's a difference, right, in the expected growth of a school or a teacher if they have one special ed kid in their class versus if they have 25 or if they have 85% free and reduced versus 2% free and reduced. Oh, our formula can't take that into account. Um, so it, it really, it's a difficult situation. I, I think, so, so you've got Kelly and, and Jake and, and team trying to digest this, as Jake said, to try to put this to you. It, we laughed earlier when mm -hmm. you asked, can you calculate and calculate all this. The 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 and thank goodness we've got strong strong people, but you cannot follow their formulas enough to be able to get to the raw numbers to be able to sit. Let's go ahead and hand calculate it. That the math and the formulas are, are at such a high level, and they don't make sense. So it's difficult to reverse engineer. You, you cannot go back and say, okay, here's the kids we had before us. Let's hand calculate to see if are there errors in here, or are there not. What is you know what happens if we had this group of kids perform better, or what would happen if you can't do that hands hand work? Yeah, so you really worry, and you'll see it at the end. You know, you really worry about their data upload. Just like okay, your formula is fine. We'll, we'll trust that that's good. But do you at least have the right data for the right kids and the right codes? And you know, so there, there's just a lot of guesswork here. Can we just get the raw data and? I mean, I know Jake and Kelly, you guys are really great analytical people. You can make some conclusions based on? Yeah, we, I think we do that with the College and Career Readiness Report Card. Yeah, there you go. We're already doing it basically. Yeah. Well, and, and that, again, as a board, that's what really led you as a, as a group, uh, as a whole. Some of you I know weren't on the board at that time, but really said, we have the state measure but what really do we value here and how do we track that data internally to create the SASD Career and College Readiness Report Card? Right. That we know what the data is going in, we know who those kids are, we know how it is calculated, we can look and develop appropriate goals off of that in a much different area. Now, with that said, obviously there's this level of accountability that we've gotta be able to respond to. You need as a board to understand to the best of your ability through us of what this what this means. But it, it really is that focus on what our SASD career college readiness is and how do we ensure that we are making progress and setting goals to get to where we've talked already tonight, how do we have 100% of our kids reaching those goals? How do we give pushback to DPI? I mean, this is ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm sure you do. I'm sure you all do. But I mean, is there something we can do to, to help push that or get other school boards? Because this is ridiculous, the amount of time you are spending trying to analyze where we could show them our career and um, uh, college oh. and career readiness, and it's crystal clear. And it's easy for the layperson to understand what goes into those numbers. I mean, this is stuff that just irritates me. How do we change the work, you know? And that's uh, a discussion that we have as state superintendents. Uh, we, okay. we have discussions with our lawmakers. Um, some of this is f coming from federal law in terms of you need to have a, a defined system, a statewide report card. And then, it, like many things, it's how do you take something that is across all the United States and try to say what makes sense for Wisconsin? And then, in that case, how do you take the 422 school districts and try to make heads or tails out of that information up into a into a report card so I guess that first point is is just really that caution that comes in in terms of how do we interpret it and what what can we really draw from the data and again and Kelly I don't want to steal your thunder uh, again but you're gonna end up 
the bulk of this, yes, it's this graduation rate, and yes, there's some of those career and college readiness indicators, but the bulk of the scores you're seeing are really based on the state test and that formula around your achievement to growth. And depending on your level of poverty, that weight of how much is on achievement and how much is on growth really can change. So uh, some of our county school districts have had high achievement, but their growth scores have been non-existent. And they can get a score, or somebody else can get a high score and have tremendous growth and very limited you know, overall achievement because that it's a variable weighted system. Um, and then you try to play that out across our district, but then each of our schools, because we have a different level of poverty across our buildings in terms of those students that qualify for free or reduced lunch, the number of EL, number of special ed, all of those factors play into that as well. And so then I think you gotta take some generalities around that notion of how are we doing in comparison with some of those subpopulations compared to other school districts when you look at the district-wide data? I'm sorry, I didn't mean to steal your both of your thunders there. Um, Thank you. Okay. okay. I, I taught English for a reason. You know, this just <laughs> this whole thing just really fries my brain. But if I'm looking at this correctly, where it says economically disadvantaged with the circle in 63.2 percent. Is that the percentage of our kids who are considered economically disadvantaged in the whole district or the kids that took the test? In the whole district. Okay. Can you estimate a little bit what that percentage is of the kids who actually took the test? If poverty is the biggest driver? I'd say it's relatively comparable. I would think it's relatively comparable. <coughs> the other thing to remember there is if they didn't take the test, it counts against you, right? Correct. So they're all in that number. Um, they're just not counting. They're just not counting for. So if, like I said, if one of those, if that twenty percent, if one of those kids passes the test, it helps our score, um, and obviously more than than one would. So we've, you know, I've weighted that a little bit and looked at, you know, well, we had sixty percent advanced and proficient. If all kids would have tested and we would have, you know carried that same weight forward, we would have been at 75. I'm just guessing at that because there's just no way to know how those kids would have scored. Um, but so is this tied to funding at all? So not that's really. not our issue, right? Yeah. So well, I'm relatively new to this. Is this, is this how do we, we, we know it's flawed. That's, that's becoming very obvious to me that it's flawed. And we know that we're dealing with a really unusual year for the testing. So that creates some questions. What do you think is the benefit for our kids in this district to us spending time on this? Knowing that it's flawed and knowing that we had an anomaly for the year, what can we gain from this that's useful? And how much of this should we say, okay, we did what you asked us to do and we ended up with a fuzzy result and we're not going to invest a lot of energy in it because we have our own indicator locally that's a better measure of what we're achieving. Yeah, I think we I think we look at it at the elementary and middle school a little bit, um, and it's somewhat helpful. But again, the growth becomes really hard uh, to understand. High school, we don't use it at all. Um, and elementary and middle school, we have that report card coming. It's going to have three years worth of data, so we'll see trends on there. Uh, we desegregate that data. It's just, we have we have better tools. This isn't this really isn't meant for schools. This is meant for the public. Uh, it was meant, you know, however you want to take it politically from a um, school choice perspective and being able to rate schools. I, I think the hard thing for me personally, what I have a lot of pride in this district, is we have a 63.5. That doesn't sound so great. There isn't another school that has a poverty level within like about 10 points of us that scored that high, right? So you start working your way down on compar comparables and you're gonna get all the way down to Madison before you find a school that has a better score. So West Dallas has got, oh, uh, where are they? They're at 63% free and reduced, we're at 63.2. Our demographics are exactly, this, almost exactly uh, the same. Special Ed, we're at 17.5, they're at 15.6. <coughs> you know, we're at 18.5, they're only at 4.1. They score a 55.9, we score a 63.5. So that's our best comparable in-house. The other one that's really good always is Janesville. Um, 
sitting at about 9,500 kids, and they're at 54.7, so they're nine points less than us, uh, free and reduced. They score a 56.8. Um, so to our comparables, we do really well, right? We're essentially the fourth poorest um, district, and, and we do really well there, but there's no way, I don't know how you say that, I don't know how I call the press and say, hey, we did really well compared to. If you caught what Jake just said, That's if you start looking at comparables and you look at the high poverty, we have a strong economy in Sheboygan County, but when you look at the families that we serve, of the top 21 largest school districts, Sheboygan has the fourth highest poverty rate of any of those. It's Milwaukee, Racine, Green Bay, Sheboygan in the state of Wisconsin for large districts. We're the ninth largest school district in the state of Wisconsin, but we do have the fourth highest poverty level. And then you factor in the other things that Jake mentioned, no special ed, EL. It, it just, it, it, it helps to look at those comparables. Um, and when so Jake was earlier talking about poverty, I just want to make sure that I highlighted that one once for you, because um, just to catch where we fall within our large district comparables um, on that, because that does for the key drivers Jake already mentioned. And I think it's what's a little scary in, in this is when I talk with other districts our size, they're like, how'd you get the score you got? Um, I, I don't know that there's a heck of a lot of room for growth here. I, I think we're doing pretty good, but it doesn't look good, right? Like, that's where I, I really become frustrated in this, and, and that's and where it gets hard. It's, you know, where, where you can improve, because the state says, well. Yeah, and if our poverty level good. keeps going up, is it is realistically, is there anything we can do? And at some point, I understand coming in here and saying no excuses, all that good stuff, but I have to also look at our teachers and say, get those results. Um, and if it's not, if no one else is getting those results, it's really hard to look at our teachers and say, you know what, do something that no other district in the state is doing. Um, that's my expectation of you. That gets that gets really hard. So I, I think we do really, really well. We just can't sell it as that. That's that's the frustrating piece. Only other piece I would add to at you know that district level when we're talking about that target group outcome, maybe a source of comfort is that when I look through the list of those students, um, you know me coming from Pigeon River, able to look through that and know those students by name and by face, um, we recognize those students. We've already identified those students years before they're telling us who those students are that are struggling, who those students are that we should be intentional with interventions. And we are working with those students and actually several more students than those that have been identified. So um, while that tool has never meant to be a let's, let's pinpoint individual students per se, we have other tools in house to do that. Um, we are seeing comparable information and we're actually, I would say, doing a better job of finding those students and helping them close those gaps so I may be curious to see um, sorry no, go ahead. I may be curious to see with our comparables are they providing the same broad range of services that we do to support kids I think this is a conversation I know David and I have had it quite a few times um, you know the there's always this push and pull right to educate kids but at the same time we're, we're providing three meals a day in many of our buildings right we're providing aftercare uh, for school care, uh, transportation services, right? We become as much of an education entity as a social services firm, and, and with with good reason, right? We understand what that means for especially those families that are economically challenged, and we know that disproportionately those are having kids in our county are the ones that are struggling most with wages, right? Um, but I'd be curious if the Jamesville or uh, uh, West, Dallas. West Dallas, thank you are providing that same level of social support and services to their families to help help those kids. Um, I think that that might be exactly where we're seeing the differential and in, in achievement in that we're providing additional structures and supports and services. You know, um, kids are hungry if they're dealing with trauma at home or things like that. Is your, to your point, Jake, there's only so much you can tell staff to do. Right? Mm -hmm. They've already identified it, but you can't you can't fix the the anxiety the kids have when they're dealing with dysfunction at home. Okay. I, I'm actually, I mean, I know it, it may not market well, but I'm actually pretty pleased with this. Um, 
I mean, I, I've raised four kids through high school. Two of them graduated from a very affluent small community near here that, you know, has almost no one in poverty. And I consciously made a decision when we adopted a child of color to move to this community. And I'm glad I did because it gave her a much better experience than she would have had as one of the handful of children of color in that other district. It's not the same. I mean, it, the, the point behind that, I mean, people will argue what the intention was when they put these report cards out there, but I don't, I don't believe that it was intended for us to use to improve our schools. I think it was meant for public shaming and people biting against each other and justifying school vouchers and privatization of public education. And so, as I sit here on a public school board, I personally don't want to buy into it because I don't think its intention is pure. Um, so I appreciate you giving us the information and I'm sorry it's such a hot mess, <laughs> but I, I'm not going to get worked up about it and I am going to look at the comparables just like I would if I was buying a house. And I'm going to say, considering everything, I'm, I'm pretty, I'm pretty pleased with it, even if it doesn't market well. Well, the bottom line is that this is the state standard that's been established. And I would really like to understand what these numbers are because the public is going to be asking us, why are these numbers why they are? So regardless if we're going to use it for instructing our students, I need to use it because it's been publicized for whatever the purpose is. But I would, um, I would encourage you to, to talk about the comparable thing that was just brought up. Because I think if people ask you a question, well, I think and you would mention the comparables, we look better. I thought I had the floor, but that is part of the presentation. You told us the comparables, and we'll be able to speak to that if we can continue to hear what it is that the state has, has given us in trying to regurgitate these numbers. I find it a little ironic that the governor of this state came from being the state superintendent and has, you know, has not overseen this as being a problematic and it's created a bigger mess and, and a headache. I, you know, that's a little bit disappointing that way. But. And I would say, I mean, I will offer that we're still motivated by this. By no means are we just like, meh. <laughs> we're very motivated to take a look at this. Our school principals are looking at this information um, for what's the, what are those next steps. And again, what we end up falling upon is what are the tools do we have in our buildings that we're using presently so that we can get after it. So um, we feel good about that because we know what those tools are and we know the, the instructional practices that we have available to us. And we will work to understand this better. Um, like, like Jake had said, I'm a member of our CESA 7 meetings for the district assessment coordinators. We're getting information from there and um, there is no clear cut explanation, but as we get it, we will certainly bring that back to you. Um, looking at then individual school-based report cards, um, you will see that we have two of our schools that have moved up into significantly exceeds expectations. Four other schools moved up in category as well. And we had five of our schools move down in category. So six up, five down, the remainder staying right where they are. I should note though that Central um, was formerly scored as an alternative accountability school. So they are new to our report card rating system. And um, we know that our Central High School is an alternative program for our students. Um, and so certainly while um, nobody likes to see that score there, we're gonna look a little bit at career and college readiness pieces and for what um, Lisa and her team is focused on doing with the students that attend at Central. So. Again, just saying we have two schools that have moved into that significantly exceeds um, with 20 others at meet expectations or better. So the reason for the chuckle earlier in our, oh, okay. yep, oh sorry, Kay, go ahead. I, I don't have the, the previous report card I have it at hand. Where were the two big high schools on the last report card? Okay, so um, I am just looking at, so South stayed the same. <coughs> North High School uh, moved down one category. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so the reason for the chuckle earlier, um, 
So recall that I said Sheboygan Area School District was ahead of the game in identifying um, what we perceive to be career and college readiness standards, and we had our own internal report card. You've seen this report before, and in fact, it's, it's attached in here two more times. But um, when they went to pull our data last December, all of our data pulled as zero, as if we had had no students participate in any career and college readiness. Um, so we are working very hard to make sure that's corrected. It was a Skyward issue and that compatibility of pulling it out of Skyward into the state, to, um, state system. So what I did do here on this slide is include what this data should have looked more like. So in green on there, you'll see that the advanced courses, we have 61.3% of, uh, of our students participating in those advanced courses. Um, 30.8 in dual enrollment coursework, sorry, uh, 5.2 in industry recognized credential coursework, um, and then work-based learning at 24.9. So if you look at that in comparison to the state, though that would also tell us that the state data is also not correct because there are other school districts like our own that the data didn't pull and they had data to share. Um, so just wanting to bring your attention to the fact that we have this information, we were able to quickly pull it from our own internal report card, um, and we are working. There's another, a they pull it in December each year, so this December I have our uh, tech team working with um, the DPI to make sure that we don't run into that again. Go ahead, Mark. But were those numbers part of the final score for the report card? Good question. So this area isn't part of a score, it's part of just a reported category. So we just report out on this, um, but it does not become a part of our report card score. Out of curiosity, is, <clears throat> you know if this was an issue with Skyward improperly formatting the data for the DPI or the DPI changing their specs and not getting through the vendor? It just so I, I'm not certain what happened here. And what we have, we have essentially done is gone back and made sure that all of our coding in Skyward is correct so that it gets pulled specifically for the coursework pieces. Um, what I can tell you for the, um, the fine arts piece, which is also an area that we report out, again, not an area for scoring, but that we are required to report out on. Um, what we found is there was a switch from fine arts and visual arts to, I'm trying to think what it was, it was another category of arts, and we had had them slotted under one area. We read that we needed to move it, so we moved it, but this data is from 2018, 2019, or sorry, yep, 2018, 2019, so we moved it too soon, and so that was our issue with that data. So again, it was accessible to us. Um, you can click on the next slide. This, again, just telling you guys, this is where our career and college readiness data yeah. came from. Um, yep. Go back to the other slide. Oh, this one. So is this taken from December 2019? So this data. Not last year, but right. the year before. Correct. Just, just simply for these two pieces that we're reporting out. So when they're pulling <laughs> and our for information. And Okay, right. wait a minute. Sometimes so it's two years ago and sometimes it's a year ago, depending on the measures. So when they're putting this report card together from last year, There's they're pulling thing. data from the year before. Correct. Sometimes it's from the year before, sometimes it's for two years before, depending on... And they on don't tell you this? What they no, do. that we knew. That part we knew. We just had been overzealous and moved some of our coursework into a different category because we knew that the DPI was asking us to do that, but we had done it too soon. So when they pulled it, they didn't have access to the data that we no, had but, but somehow they pulled it from 19. Correct. And you said, wait a minute, you can pull it from 2020. Correct. And that's what they're going to pull for this year. That's what they'll pull from this year. Yes. So we're, we, we're playing that game, but we do have that in there. Again, not a perfect thing. If you want to click one more time. Again. Forward. Yep. So if you take a look here, this is the fine arts data that we were talking about. So. Again, this is, this is not exact, but we were able to pull together the data, what would better reflect how many students are participating in our district in arts and design courses. So 449 students at the high school level are participating in arts and design courses. 22 in 19, dance. 19, yep, yep, from the data. Last year. Correct, because 
the data that they wanted for was from 1920. That's a real disconnect. Yeah. You got two different years here. One is COVID and one isn't. Correct. Correct. Yep. Um, 22 in dance, 441 in music, and 37 in theater. So we do obviously have students participating in fine arts. We just need to make sure they're coded correctly in there so that it pulls this December so that the next report card next school year you will be able to see that correctly. Going on then to career and college readiness um, report cards. Again, um, looking at those outcomes for individual student post uh, graduation self selection. So this is looking at now last year's um, graduating class. Okay. When we look at this data, I broke it down into um, these objectives as far as what career readiness looks like and how our different um, dis or how our district is doing compared to how our schools are doing. So again, if you look, our district would say 78.5% of our students are career ready. You want to click just because there's a better visual representation here. Then as we look at our um, different schools, we have Central at 65.3, we have Etude at 52.2, North at 83.1, South at 75.2, and Werner at 89.3. Again, what we're talking about is having a 90% attendance rate, having 25 hours of community service, workplace learning experiences, industrial credentials, dual cre uh, credit career pathway courses, and two or more organized co-curricular activities um, as far as participation. So that's broken down um, a couple different ways. Keep in mind that um, COVID likely, very likely, impacted our community participation on this report card. So uh, we would hope to grow that in this more normal school year. Anything else on that one? No, I think this is the stuff that we always talk about, right? So, and and Mark said it earlier, like if 80, you know, for we're, we're shooting for 80 percent, what does that say? And I would probably argue that 80 percent is pretty good, but also there are districts that look into should this be a requirement for graduation or should some of these things be a requirement for graduation and I always think that's on the, the table for discussion as well if community service is really important to us in this district maybe that's something we say we want all kids to do etc so um, just just something to think about for future discussions Uh, last slide then is looking at our students that we are sending off to college. 59.1% uh, of our students as a district are prepared to move off to college. If we look again at them by, um, by school, you can see that Central having 25% of students, Etude having 25, North having 64.5, South having 55.6, and Werner having 62.5 percent of their students prepared to be successful in college based on our benchmarks of um, having a GPA of 2.8 or better, um, taking some advanced coursework and receiving an A, B, or C in that advanced coursework. Um, those classes like our CAP classes, our AP classes. Dual credit college coursework, um, advanced algebra two, having an A, B, or C or better. And then finally, the ACT scores as they relate to a four year um, ACT exam of an 18 or better in English, 22 or better in reading, 23 or better in science, 22 or better in math. And similarly, in, for a two year performance of English at 18, reading at 18, science at 18, and math at 18. What percentage of our kids are enrolled in a two or four year college? It's about 60 percent. Oh. Yeah, it's it is and it isn't right. So this is of the kids who said they wanted to go to college. Oh, so it's not the right. So uh, and that's why this doesn't. This is 59.1, but 47.8 percent of all our kids hit that right. So this G1 report where we have 47.8, 313 kids out of 655. That's all kids. Um, that graduated here, Kelly pulled just the kids that said they wanted to go to two or four year. Uh, again, that 
that number is pretty decent, but it, it jives with, it, it, it almost adds credibility to the redefining ready data because we know about 50% of high school kids go on to college and flunk out, right? Yep. That's, the, that's the national average, so when we see those numbers somewhere, but you know, in the 50s, that, that's probably pretty accurate, and that's why we just keep hammering on this um, stuff with our high schools. And North and South are gonna come in front of you, they're gonna give detailed uh, explanation of their report card and what they're working on. This is what we have them set their goals on every single year. Um, and all that good stuff. Colleges keep coming back. Marquette got rid of ACT. A uh, number of, of schools have. They keep coming back and they say it's GPA and it's the most advanced course that you pass. Those are the two uh, best indicators of college success. So that's why we push so hard for that dual credit college uh, and for the GPA. So uh, I think you'll, you'll hear that continue to be our focus for college kids. Um, what's really nice about this data, I think, is you can get get away from the free and reduced lunch, get away from everything else, and look at families and say, if your kids want to go to college, look at all the opportunities in our district and look at how well kids do and utilize, you know, uh, and I think that's probably the strength of our district. Mm -hmm. Definitely the strength. Additional questions for David? I just want to thank and Kelly and uh, Jake for the work on, on this and the rest of the s team as they uh, will be working with our principals um, and uh, coming forward for additional um, discussion around our career college readiness indicators and uh, you know how do we best support our students uh, to continue their growth, whether they are not yet at standard or whether they are already exceeding it, so that we can continue to have all of our students that experience high quality growth. Yeah, I personally would just like to thank um, Jay Kelly, the, the whole EMT. I mean, data these days is often a four letter word, both literally and figuratively, right? Um, but it's incredibly valuable, and I, the thing that I appreciate the most is just kind of the candor of the conversation. I think there's a number of EMTs that come to this particular meeting of the year anxious and perhaps trying to polish something unsavory and, and go around it. Um, just my perspective as a board member, I appreciate the candor of the understanding, the expressing the challenges of sorting through the data, what you find meaningful, and, and how we're implementing that. I think it's the only way that we grow as an organization. So, thank you. Uh, thank you. The uh, <coughs> next item is a, a first reading, and we have two second readings, so we'll take the, we'll take the second readings together. Um, the first, uh, miscellaneous C, introduction, first reading, revised Board of Education Policy, uh, a 80 religious and patriotic ceremonies and services. Stephanie, yeah, I just wanted to. Uh, Clarify. This is the policy that we discussed uh, last month, and uh, we asked to come back around the verbiage in the first paragraph, which uh, we can see it's stricken out the word church, and we have place of worship, if any, uh, because it doesn't have to be a formal place for, for worship. So we did go ahead and uh, make that word um, uh, change, and uh, that you were requesting some different language there. So uh, that. Um, I appreciate you uh, giving us the ability to come back. Um, everything else in the policy stayed as is, because that was the only um, concern that you had at that point in time. Any other questions for Seth? I move first. Move, is there a second? Second. Move seconded, Mark? I was trying to recall what Kay's concern was with that verbiage. I, I, in regards to making a place, of going from church to place of worship. Did you want me to answer that? Yeah. Yeah. My my concern of that is that not everyone attends a church. My two oldest children attended a synagogue. We have people in our district who attend a mosque. We have people who don't attend any house of worship but consider themselves religious people when they stand on the shore of Lake Michigan. So I was just trying to expand it to something that would not leave out any of our students, our families. I guess I've got two concerns in regards to this. Number one, we pay NAOLA a lot of money 
to come up with these, and it's reviewed by their attorneys, and they have specific verbiage, especially as it relates to the First and the Fourteenth Amendment in, in regards to this paragraph, that's what it was referring to. The First Amendment is referencing freedom of religion. Now, I would have to agree with you, I don't know that the original verbiage of saying church, but the church was referenced a religious belief system, not a physical building. So I think when we change that verbiage to a place of worship, I think we're losing what the original intent was here of what this recommendation was. I mean, because church is both a physical building or a church of a belief system. And I think that changing it, number one, is contrary to, you know, I think whenever we're starting to tweak any of these Neola things, I think that we're opening ourselves up for problems potentially. Do I see this as ever being a problem? Probably not. And I don't want to spend too much time on this, but <clears throat> I think changing it to a place of worship loses what the original meaning and intent was on what the uh, the policy was. Yeah, I, I did inquire about that because, you know, obviously they reference in here the First and Fourteenth Amendment, and so I, I did consult with, with Bob. Um, Bob is actually does consult with Naola as one of the Wisconsin-based attorneys. Uh, Bob actually said, hey, that was a good catch, that we, uh, he will be working with his team at Naola to say this hasn't, uh, other districts that Bob represents haven't either brought this policy change forward yet because this is one of the new changes. Um, and he said, actually, that's um, going to be most likely Naola's next revision, where we are one step ahead. So he actually said, it doesn't change at all the context. And he said, actually, you're better off to to do that, because for that very reason that Kay was mentioned, not everybody, it's it's really referencing that freedom of religion as an aspect, as a, even though the church is used, in this case, by not saying church, he said we're better off as a district by doing that and protecting all of our students. So actually, his recommendation was, yeah, that, and it was his verbiage, including the word if any, to count for those people who do not use a physical location to worship, if you will. So that was his, um, so you would see this coming forward in the future as I know all a change anyway, um, is where Bob left it with me. Yeah, but it's still, I mean, that change is talking about a specific location, if any, but it's referencing a religious belief system, not not a physical location or not a physical location. Yeah, and, and Bob, when he talked through that, really said that it, it that is, the, the intent here was to, with this notion of the word, of the church of his or her choice, most people, because you, you got to, again, read this for what most people would interpret it, and they're going to interpret it, oh, I go to that church, that place, even though... That's not how I interpret it. Yeah. But I guess they're not most people. Uh, uh, yeah. I understand that there's going to be different interpretations. I guess the question becomes, as a board, and you're looking at a policy as a board, how do you in interpret that and make sure that we are representative of our, of our school, children, and our community? I mean, it's, you know, if you're, you're going to talk about the physical location of, you know, St. Dominic's versus uh, St. Clement's, you, you know, but we're talking about protecting the rights of an individual that has a Catholic religious belief system, not necessarily which church they go to. And so that, it, it just seems like we're fixing something that doesn't need to be fixed. Right now, do I agree that it should be church? Not necessarily. I think a religious belief system is what we're trying to achieve here. Mm. But if any, yeah. I. Okay. I mean, I, I don't want to get too deep into the wordsmithing of it, but you've got the word "and" after the word "individual" there, so. If what you're talking about is the belief system, we could just stop with the word individual. Why do we have the and? I think the and is what takes you to the next situation, which is why I think you need something more inclusive. If you didn't have the and, if you were go expanding beyond the word individual, you would just stop there. Unfortunately, my computer died and I can't pull it up right now. <coughs> Well, the reason that's in there, Kay, is because the First the first Amendment is referencing the freedom of religion, 
The Fourteenth Amendment is specific to individual rights, and so that's why it's the and. Fourteenth Amendment incorporates the First Amendment against state governments and public and, and local governments. The, uh, I think the and is. I think again, I don't want to get too far into wordsmithing here, but church is often used in theological doctrine, referring to both the body of worship and the physical location. Um, so, so for example, in New Testament writings, when reference to the church in, in Peter's writings, it's the church as a whole in a eclectic sense, not a specific place of worship. Um, in the first century which is today. But um, we're getting really down the rabbit hole here. Um, well, yeah. but the bottom uh, line uh, here is we're, 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 all we're saying is we're going to protect your right if you go to a specific church, not the fact that you're a Catholic or a Lutheran or a Protestant or an atheist. And I think that's what we're trying to achieve here. Right. Am I not correct? I, 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 I agree. I think that <coughs> case point, case I agree. I'll take in that the, we can just use better verbiage other than church. Um, if it's, I think you're referencing in terms of the, the faith system or the belief system of the individual and their, uh, I, I, uh, I don't want to workshop on the floor, but agree it would be more of a... Well, it should just be religion. I mean, that's what the First Amendment actually uses. Our attorney approved this? Yeah. yeah. <coughs> okay. Yeah, I call for the vote. Been moved. Is there a second? Second. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Nay. Motion carries. Uh, we'll take uh, D and E together if you have any objections. Either side or read. Seeking a motion to approve miscellaneous items D and E. Second. Second. Moving second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Uh, Item number 10, which is report committees. First is curriculum instruction, which is me. Uh, there is a, a, a item number one uh, is the introduction of a new course, which is pretty exciting, specifically around game development. Um, so looking at new ways of getting students engaged in coding and um, engaging in that kind of intellectual uh, development schools uh, skills. And it was really curriculum design in house here, uh, which is pretty exciting. Uh, as the chair, I'm not able to make motions, but I'm seeking a motion to approve item one. So moved. Second. Uh, any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Uh, two and three are um, for information only. Uh, item B, human resources. Mark. I would move approval for item number one, appointments, and item number three, retirements, that were listed in the minutes of the uh, HR committee. Second. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Anything further? No. Uh, C, facilities of rec. Brian. Thank you very much, Mr. Vice President. Um, I move approval of items number one and two, both the uh, Schwalding Theater Company financial reports and the Community Recreation Department's financial reports. Second. Moved and seconded. Uh, any further discussion? None. All in favor say aye. The opposed? Motion carries. And the facility permit report is for your reading pleasure. Thank you. Uh, finance and budget, Marsha. <coughs> Thank you. I am going to break this out a little bit. I'm going to take, um, I'd like to uh, make motion for items number one, two, and three for our fund 41 capital projects, statement of cash flow revenues and expenditures reports as listed in our minutes. Second. Second. Any discussion? We're back from audit, so we have these again. Excellent. All, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Um, I would like to move for a motion and um, a second and then have a little discussion about the fund balance item number five. So the motion is there a second? Uh, second. Second. Marsha. Thank you. Um, I um, just wanted to talk about our fund balance a second. I think uh, Mark and the um, EMT team did a great job, and I know the board has seen this before, um, but this is the final vote tonight for our fund balance. Our fund balance is about $55.5 million, our general fund balance, that is. 
and according to our board policy, we require that we leave an unassigned balance of between 15 to 20 percent. Um, after, if we approve this today, our unassigned balance will be about $25.7 million, which equals 18.5 percent of the general budget, which falls within our parameters. All of you have reviewed the list of items. Are there any questions that we, Mark or I can answer? Any further discussion? Are none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Okay, and then I did forget to um, go over item number four that was budget revisions and transfers of appropriations, which was information only. And then um, the final item, item number six, is gifts, which we have one minute to approve. The Heisen Family Foundation donated $3,500 to YouTube for expanding for their Expanding Horizons program. <coughs> Second. We can second it. Any further discussion? Here we go. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carried. That's it. Thank you, Marcia. I have a report from the committee of the whole. <coughs> I'll look over to um, Brian. Any report on legislative breakfast? Yeah, probably the most controversial thing that was brought up during the legislative breakfast was Mark announcing to everyone in the room that he's no good with numbers. Um, <laughs> but other than that, no, it was it was a pretty, pretty quiet meeting. Um, it was Mark's dry sense of humor. Yeah. <laughs> Um, it, it was it was a fairly quiet meeting. Um, there is not a whole lot going on um, with the Senate legislature, uh, the the assembly. They're doing committee work. Um, we did have some discussion about um, a proposal that has been made um, to uh, require school districts to have. Um, education based on the history of Asian Americans in Wisconsin, which would be very similar to the, uh, the mandate that we have uh, for Native Americans. Um, and I just thought I'd mention it. I said this is something that WASB is, it was looking at. Um, yeah, it's bring up to their, um, you know, to the delegate assembly in January. Um, I asked what, what their thought was and um, got little to no no feedback as as per usual, but um, but yeah, that was that was pretty much the the main thing that I had. Seth, I don't know if you wanted to add anything or not. No, we were actually usually meet about an hour or so, and we were done in about twenty minutes at that. Mm -hmm. There just wasn't a lot to talk about this this time around, based on where they're at, and not being on the floor, um, you know, anywhere soon. So that's was the meeting. Okay. Any questions for Ryan or Seth? Mark, can you can you report in the five minutes? Uh, no, just that they, they, we had a really good meeting um, on the 15th, so that committee is now starting to get kind of into the meat of the, their process. They're, they're looking at each of the objectives now and looking at how each uh, option meets, meets that objective. And we got quite through quite a few um, objectives, and uh, we are not meeting in December. We'll meet again the um, third Monday in January and continue um, rating the, the different options. So we're moving along. Find anything to add? Yeah, um, I was able to attend to attend this meeting, um, and I think I was impressed by the commitment to that the com that the community members had, they, they, and and, um, you know, and and the staff that were there as part of the committee. Um, they, they've given some serious thought to this. Um, it will be interesting, you know, to see once you know all the rating is done, and then we start talking about dollars and cents. You know how that would affect you know their recommendations. Um, but um, you know, as of right now, I don't think the the committee is anywhere close to making a to making a recommendation as far as um, building the new or modeling or somewhere or somewhere in between for both middle schools. Questions for Mark or Ryan? All right. Communications are listed for information. Each meeting dates for next one is set. Oh. Yeah. So, um, talk about that, David. As we you. typically do for December, what we propose, and unless there's an objection from anyone, we roll 
the regular board meeting to the 14th, we would just meet on the one date. Unless the board feels strongly about meeting on December 28th. We would just have the one meeting on the 14th. We would do committees. We would not do committee in the hall. We would just have the regular board meeting. Anybody have any of major significance that would cause me to have the second meeting date? There's nothing that we no, need to have done by the end of the month that would cause us to have pause for that. Um, as I've spoken with David, we can do the business we need to do it between the committees and the full board meeting. And the plans would still meet here for that one meeting. In That's December. correct. That's correct. Our tables are never, never land right now. <laughs> okay, so we will just have the one meeting in the summer on the 14th. This will be the regular committees that made the whole and then we're going to Do we have to vote on that? Oh, we can. But I'm not saying what we have. I just see it's listed yeah, for action. Unless anybody's got a concern with it, I think we just we're say good. we're going to do it. Okay. Is there still community it. input? Can I ask that? Sorry. Excuse me? Is there still community input? There will be that night, sure. Yeah. That night? Okay. Yeah. Just checking, sorry. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Good Move. question. <laughs> Move to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Is there a second? Second. second. Now the video all is in the chat. I know.